¿Y dónde estaban los directores que pudieran llegar y crear películas negras? En el 86 esta pregunta fue respondida fuerte y enfáticamente. Spike. 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 It was like an announcement. Playback. Like, look, we're here, we're self-contained, and bow, we're not going anywhere. Spike Lee, un hermano salido directamente de Brooklyn, se adueñó de Hollywood y el cine nunca sería lo mismo. Here we were as black filmmakers saying, you know what, I'm not just going to sit in the back of the bus anymore cinematically, I'm going to get up in front and drive this bad boy. Spike no era parte del sistema, era un rebelde. He understood the power of being independent. He represented Brooklyn and he was holding his own and his attitude was do or die. He was willing to bring various stories that have been overlooked in the mainstream. He wasn't afraid to be black as can be, and he was giving it to you straight up with no hose bars, and he didn't water it down. La primera película de Spike, She's Gotta Have It, mostró una rebanada de vida negra como nunca antes la habían visto. She's Gotta Have It was the most different thing I'd ever seen as a film. The fact that it was black and white. He incorporated the jazz and, and, and the hipness to his film. It was a middle class situation. It wasn't people running around in the ghetto. This whole place is yours, huh? The whole place. I likes, I likes. So it's the first time you're seeing people who look like the new generation of black people on screen. Fue también la primera vez que los cinéfilos encontraban a una hermana como Nola Darling. Nola Darling was a black woman. She was beautiful, she was sexy, and she was doing her thing. You know, just watching a, a girl just jumping from guy to guy was different, and she was black, and she was having a great time. Her character is like what sex in the city is now. She made her own sexual choices. It's about control. My body, my mind. And she was unapologetic behind them. Who's gonna own it, them or me? A pesar de su bajísimo presupuesto de 175 mil dólares para filmarla, She's Got a Habit recaudó cerca de 7 millones en taquilla y convirtió a Spike en un símbolo instantáneo de la cultura popular. The line outside that theater was a coming of age of a, the black middle class. Everyone from Russell Simmons to the other Fab Five Freddy, that movie actually signaled a real change. So, Spike was the first true black superstar director. La próxima película de Spike, School Days, exploró la vida universitaria negra y continuó posicionando territorio ignorado por Hollywood. Why no? I love School Days. Man, I gotta go to college, because I gotta experience this and I gotta do that. En el campus de Spike, el estatus económico. Can't find jobs because of you. La vida de nerds. I am a real man, a gamma man. Y la conciencia negra estaba al centro y al frente. We need to march. We need to protest. Right. We need to shut the school down if need be. Spike Lee's just the king of holding the mirror up and showing you without any fear or any reservations. He talked about things that were happening in our community, things that honestly some of us were ashamed of, like myself. Wanna be white, Jigaboo? He was talking to black people about being prejudiced toward their own people. Barbie doll. Hi, yellow heifer. He was putting it out on Front Street. He doesn't take the spice and flavor out of the soul food so white people can digest it easier. He just serves you the meal as it is, like it or not. You can want to see your monkey ass back to Africa if you want to. I don't like that people condemn Spike for telling black stories, but nobody ever condemns Woody Allen for telling white stories. Why are you mad at Spike, but you ain't mad at Woody? Come on now. He's always pissed people off. You're not an artist if you don't piss people off. Los blancos apartados por School Days se preparaban para un impacto mayor y más negro del señor Lee. Yo! En el 89, en el día más caluroso del verano en Brooklyn, Spike desencadenó una de las películas más racialmente cargadas jamás hechas, dejándole saber al mundo cuán temible podía ser un negro con una cámara, una misión y un mensaje. Wake up! Do the right thing. It was explosive. I was, I was shocked. When Do the right thing came out, a lot of reactionary critics. Well, this is going to cause riots. It was just stupid. The do the right thing made people uncomfortable. That's precisely what art ought to do. People are honest. A lot of them are not going to like what they see in themselves. Hopefully, they'll, they'll want to make a change. From the very first frame, Do the Right Thing was thick with tension. That opening was Rosie Perez dancing. Oh, 
fight where she's boxing. Fighting the power. Just to come out fighting. It was just like fighting her power, man. What a great way to start the movie off. Fight the power. You know, nobody was hotter than Public Enemy at that time. It was a no-brainer to, to pick up the attitude and the tension that Spike was trying to say and do the right thing. Desde el primer cuadro, do the right thing exudaba tension. Hey, hey, Sal, how come there ain't no brothers on the wall? How come there ain't no brothers on the wall? Why ain't got no brothers on the wall? Why ain't got no brothers on the wall? Los conflictos raciales eran crudos y verdaderos. The most memorable scene for me is when representatives from all of the races are just like shouting out all of the names. Garlic bread, pizza sling, me no speaky American. Fifteen in a car, thirty in an apartment. Jew, ass. Gold teeth, gold you gold chain, chain gold fried, fried chicken, chicken biscuits eating. He had everybody cursing each other out. Thank you, pizza, pizza, and go to back to Africa. But like white America was like, oh, it's a little too much. But it was like this is how people think. But in order to stop it, you have to you have to admit the problem. Hasta las escenas graciosas apretaron candentes botones raciales. The shoe scene was like incredible. Yo! Because you know it wasn't just like. The black guy stepped on his shoes. It was the white guy stepped on his shoes wearing the Larry Bird, you know, wearing the Larry Bird jersey. Then why'd you move back to Massachusetts? I was born in Brooklyn. No! Do the Right Thing culminó con una de las escenas más controversiales y desgarradoras en la historia de los filmes recientes. Radio Raheem's death and Do the Right Thing. It's very painful because if you have another black man dying at the hands of law enforcement. You know, brothers were catching hell in Los Angeles, in Oakland, in Chicago, in Atlanta, and that's why it resonated. Spike was able to show how that rage that went underground, that rarely surfaced in the mainstream, was there boiling. The stories that he's told, especially in films like Do the Right Thing, are stories that only Spike Lee could tell. He had a vision, he had an antenna up that, that no white director, or really no other director, seemed to be able to capture. Do the Right Thing ganó 28 millones de dólares en taquilla, y le ganó a Spike una nominación al premio de la Academia por Mejor Guión Original. Una cosa estaba clara, el director negro ya no era un desconocido, un incógnito no visto en Hollywood. Whether you agree with Spike's art or his politics, you cannot deny he's a towering artist and he has political courage. Spike Lee had a vision of himself and manifested that. He inspired himself and in doing so inspired others. Spread the seal. 